This is This Week in Economics, uh, Numbers Man here. Very interesting uh, week uh, going on there. Uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve, Dr. Janice Yellen, gave her first report to the people in forms of a press conference. A press conference is a fairly new device, or uh, as one would say, outlet for the Federal Reserve, begin, uh, which began under Dr. Bernanke of the... Uh, during his, I should say, tenure as the chief of the reserve uh, office there. But it what, it what it tries to do, and this is kind of an interesting situation, is give more transparency to the people and, quote-unquote, to the markets. Now, that also implies we asked another question. How important are the markets to the American economy versus the actions of the Fed. Now, the Fed has a dual mandate. Stability in the economy, uh, the economic uh, portfolio, and dealing with unemployment or employment, whichever one you want to talk about. Hopefully, we have enough time here. We'll go into a little bit of a paper by uh, Freddie Kruger, uh, excuse me, Alan Kruger of Princeton on short and long-term uh, unemployment, the Phillips curve, and uh, several other little things. We don't obviously have time to uh, to go into the entire paper, but we can sort of outline it uh, basically where the argument is about short term. Now, their definition, there's several definitions, but our working definition and the definition that they have is 26 weeks. Now, remember, the 26 weeks is for people that are made redundant or unemployed that uh, register with the federal job service are the state job service via the federal job service those are the people that are included in the quote-unquote short-term unemployment now those that uh, pass the 26 weeks are going into long-term unemployment so basically what that means is uh, people that are unemployed more than six months we'll say a year two years we look at that as having a uh, less of a chance of being uh, re-employed uh, for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons that businesses give is uh, that uh, people that are unemployed for long periods of time, their job skills lessen. Now, that would obviously depend on which fields they're going into. In many uh, fields, the service uh, fields, for example, uh, if you start out, say, for instance, with fast foods, uh, the fast foods probably have not changed very much in five years. Many sales jobs, uh, basically, it's about the same uh, being in uh, information technology uh, sales. Um, that does change because your product uh, line uh, changes uh, whatever products you are pushing out the door, so to speak. But in many other uh, markets or market sectors, uh, it doesn't change uh, as drastically. Now, given the automobile today was not the automobile 10 years ago, but the talking points are pretty much the same. So when you consider that particular part of the argument, the uh, skills-based update is is usually not that important. Now, if someone is working in an outdated uh, factory, and of course the factory is now highly automated, those people uh, would not uh, be likely candidates, uh, with the exception of perhaps sweeping the floor, which is probably uh, outsourced to someone else. So you look at that that particular situation, but also you have to look at it uh, in terms, and this is another part of the argument, there are not as many quote-unquote openings in many uh, sectors uh, as they were perhaps at one time. In other words, we'd look at an auto plant would have, say, 5,000 workers. Today it has 1,500 workers. So it is a cut there. Uh, things are uh, automated, and also the amount of training that a worker uh, needs is not probably as drastic as, as highlighted. There are obviously certain basic kinds of skills we used to call high school skills. Uh, having algebra, geometry, that sort of thing, uh, perhaps would help a worker along. But workers pick those up in uh, special types of courses in what used to be called technical schools. So that part of the argument is taken care of. Now, as far as, quote-unquote, the professional side of the argument, well, you'd have to look at the uh, professions. 
a doctor that is made redundant uh, for two years and has moderately kept up on uh, medical science, uh, probably would not be as alienated. A nurse, well, a different situation there, uh, depending on how long the nurse has been out. Now, if it's only, uh, say, one year, or perhaps two years, not um, not much has changed. Records have, uh, keeping has changed, but basic duties have not changed. A person could get up there. So these are some of the, some of the arguments there, long-term, short-term. But the biggest argument is how we come at that particular figure. We really don't have a very good system for determining redundancies of the number of unemployed. The federal government relies upon the job service. And the job service figures are skewed towards people that uh, register and have quote-unquote benefits. Now, many people are made redundant and they do not have enough, I believe it's called quarters, to uh, apply for unemployment insurance. So they are not counted. Or that they are working jobs that, for one reason or the other, they are uh, very apprehensive about uh, coming in there. And then, of course, you have people in the long-term sector of unemployment uh, class that have been unemployed for many years, and they look at those also going back, say, 10 or 15 years. And that figure has been pretty uh, constant. It's just now that you have a lot of on, of uh, long-term unemployed that you did not have, quote-unquote, at one time. And part of that is you have to trace that to the condition of the economy, demand, and also uh, structural. Many companies have laid off uh, people uh, that have been employed there or they went out of business. So those are some of the things. Nonetheless, let's move on. Uh, We're going to sort of go outside, inside here. Uh, Well, we'll first go to the Federal Reserve here. And the bank stress test, a very important part of the economic uh, makeup. And this is from Bloomberg. The Federal Reserve uh, corrected figures released. Oh, okay. Uh, For at least 15 of the 30 biggest banks in the annual stress test, Without changing how many failed uh, below the minimum requirements, the uh, Tier 1 common capital ratio, which were adjusted to uh, address inconsistencies in the treatment of four-quarter actual capital action uh, and assumptions about preferred uh, and employee-compensated related issuance over the course of uh, the uh, planning horizon. Interesting statement there. The figure uh, may uh, mix up part of an evaluation the Fed released, uh, will release, excuse me, next uh, week uh, there, unless you just get to it. The biggest changes to uh, the uh, minimum tier one common ratio of five, uh, uh, 0.5 tenths percent declined uh, for American Express, followed by a three, uh, three tenths percent increase uh, for MT Bank. That's based in Buffalo, New York, and Chicago's Northern Trust. The ratio for U.S. Uh, units of uh, SHBC, that's a London-based bank, fell uh, two-tenths of a point, and additional banks have uh, changed one-tenth of a point. Now, let's let's get to, um, we had the original list up uh, up uh, there, but again, this, this is uh, where the banks were, uh, Stress tests uh, fell. Like one bank uh, failed the uh, stress test, and I had it up uh, at one time. But it was a bank that uh, very uh, uh, few people would recognize uh, the name of uh, that particular uh, outfit. But most of the banks uh, passed the stress test, and away they go. And this comment uh, from Mark Williams. He's a former Fed examiner, bank examiner, teaches at Boston University. If the stress test is to give us uh, confidence, we now have doubled. That uh, undermines the whole purpose of the stress test. The figures make up part of evaluation. And, well, anyway, when you put out more than one figure, that is not exactly the best situation in uh, to uh, to do. So the stress test. <laughs> And reevaluating the stress test, we'll have to wait till next week to get the entire story of there. Now to uh, Janet Yellen, which you will hear from her. The argument goes on, and it's about interest rates. When should interest rates uh, be uh, 
increased. Dr. Yellen basically gave a uh, kind of a an overview saying, well, next spring. So a lot of the people have taken that to say, well, okay, maybe in April it'll jump uh, there. But Treasury yields uh, jumped uh, after the uh, after uh, Dr. Yellen spoke in the first conference. She uh, bet rates could rise in around six months after asset purchases in, and and most likely in the fall. And this is from uh, Dr. Bullard. He's uh, president of the St. Louis uh, Fed. The surveys that I've seen are from the private sector have uh, that kind of number uh, penciled in. As far as I know, that wasn't very difficult. From what we different, excuse me, what we've heard from financial markets. So I think uh, she's just repeating that at a at that time period. Bullard uh, says in a round table at the Brookings Institute, and he's not. He doesn't vote on the policy. He continually suggests that he might uh, be pushing uh, back to counter the view uh, that the Fed uh, might raise interest rates sooner than expected. They did not intend to change anything in terms of market timing or of the uh, lift-off. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Nita uh, Marshin, uh, Marshinkowski. Uh, that uh, was uh, their intent, I think, uh, what... He uh, he's trying to get uh, the intent was just to get across the intent was just to reaffirm that. So anyway, bond prices went up, uh, rose for the first time in three days as they reevaluated uh, things here. Uh, bond uh, yields fell uh, six basis points, point zero six percent to uh, three point six one percent. That was at five o'clock there. The Fed announced a third straight reduction now uh, to $55 billion uh, there. The FOIC and, uh, said a wide range of information uh, in deciding uh, when to raise the benchmark rate. Well, there, there's different uh, opinion there. 6.5% uh, has been their target for some time, and we'll hear from another economist that thinks it should be 55 And part of that is the confusion in how we arrive at what is, quote-unquote, the nominal rate of unemployment or redundancies. The central market also released new economic projections, which show that officials expect higher interest rates uh, by uh, 215, 216 compared to... Uh, with estimates released uh, in December. Fisher, this is another person, suggested investors were uh, uh, placing too much emphasis on the uh, change in forecast, which the Fed uh, illustrates as dot plot on the head chart. There's a fixation there. It is not a fetish of the dots. Uh, he said he was speaking at the London School of Economics. The change uh, in uh, forecast by Fed came uh, before the week's meeting. Uh, no doubt about that. One of the problems you have with uh, the markets, the markets have a lot of irrational expectations of what the Fed will and what the Fed will not do. Now, the reason for raising interest rates is creating these bubbles, and I think we talked a little about that. We don't see the bubbles now, but part of the problem that you have in the markets, when you have easy money out there and, of course, low interest rates, people uh, take advantage of that, and what always what happens is the greedy get greedy, greedier and they take a little too much advantage it's, it's sort of like uh, we had what the dot-com bubble and the real estate bubble and once uh, there's uh, too much activity the bubble bursts and that's one of the elements of uh, capitalism but now the fed the uh, president there uh, uh <laughs> I always block on his his name here, uh, Coachella Carter. Oh, well. Uh, was the only policymaker to dissent uh, there. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Coachella Carter uh, said uh, that the omission of the quantity benchmark uh, for policy favors uncertainty and undercuts the Fed's commitment to bring inflation towards uh, the uh, 2% target. 
An index of inflation watched by the Fed rose to, to 1.2%. That's very, very low indeed. Uh, their uh, low inflation, and Bullard back to him, uh, said he's been worried about inflation persists, persisting Excuse me, at uh, below target levels. I do think uh, that probably the best thing you can say is that it does look like it's bottomed out. Maybe uh, it's uh, coming up a bit. In uh, modern American economics, economists always worry about inflation. But the problem there is, is the age-old question, do you tolerate a little inflation and move up your rate of employment? Now, low inflation, uh, or low interest rates, does uh, respond well to uh, hiring. But now, if you are so-called inflation fighters, we saw that through... uh, Big Paul Boca, that if you have abnormally high inflation rates, which at the time uh, at the time of Jimmy Carter, inflation was up there, but also it helped out pensioners in that they were getting about eighteen nineteen percent return on their investments. But uh, by forcing things down, uh, what Doctor Boca did was turn more people or put more people in the unemployment line. So you're fighting that and you hear this big political argument about the number of people that are unemployed now. However, the same people that have that conversation, the Republicans, uh, that uh, fear inflation, don't seem to comprehend uh, if uh, they get into an inflation uh, fighting mode the number of redundancies or unemployed people will actually increase. So that is uh, one of the uh, very, very big problems. We'll just leave this uh, part here. Uh, We've spent enough time trugging around with it. And you'll um, continue to hear uh, more and more uh, about that. Uh, Let's move now to the international uh, situation so we can get more of Dr. Yellen in, and we'll move to Reuters for that. Again, this is a political problem, but it's turning into, in certain sectors, an economic problem. Uh, In the EU, I should not say sectors, I should say in the EU primarily. The sanctions against the Russian Federation because of problems in Ukraine have brought about these boycotts. But the problem is the U.S. doesn't really have... uh, trading relations there. The Danish foreign minister, I'm reading from Reuters, held a special meeting uh, for about 130 companies, including uh, the drug uh, firm uh, Novo, Novo Nordis, and the brewer uh, Carlsberg. They do a lot of business in in the Russian Republic. And basically, uh, until now, it's been business as usual. That is from... uh, Jurgen uh, Rasmussen, our focus is on our employers, our breweries, another organization out of Germany, the Hans people, they make things, Luca, Lucan, I guess, uh, makes uh, plunges over uh, farm implements, seen a big drop in orders uh, from the Russian Federation. Moscow, of course, has vowed to retaliate. Now, this is part of the problem right here. It's very easy for the American government to put so-called bank sanctions, etc., on the Russian Federation. But since most of the business is in Europe, uh, what you have is, if you have decreased uh, business activity from the, in, in terms of imports uh, to the Russian Federation, you'll have drop in demand for some of these people uh, uh, or uh, manufacturers. There is one called Profine. That's a plastic uh, window frame manufacturer with about uh, a little under a billion dollars in uh, sales. The the Rupal, of course, has slid, slid, and they said he'd managed for that by increasing sales. Uh, It won't happen, obviously, forever. In uh, Canada, uh, Bombardier, that's a plane maker, Planned a joint uh, venture with uh, Rostec. That's uh, a Russian state-owned industrial and defense conglomerate. It's likely, of course, to be delayed. 
They were selling a hundred uh, short haul uh, next generation aircrafts that's going to be held up. So that will that will hurt that uh, particular industry in uh, Canada. Visa and Mastercard uh, they've stopped providing services uh, for Rosler uh, and uh, SMP uh, Bank, whose uh, 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 owners are on uh, the list. Western Union, the money uh, transfer people, said it suspended services also to Rustler, Rustler uh, branches, uh, which, uh, but was continuing services at more than uh, 20,000 location self-service terminals in the Russian Federation. Effectively, what that does is, uh, more than anything else, that uh, stymies uh, B2B uh, trade within to the Russian Federation and also other people. Now, in Germany, a wise man's council, we need wise men and wise women also. Uh, of economic advisors said that the Ukrainian crisis was the biggest threat uh, to grow globally, especially in Germany because of the importance as an importer of energy. Well, what's going to eventually happen here as these sanctions go, the Russian Federation will put more sanctions on and as they put more sanctions on, Germany will pay dearly. Now, that's going to be a very big question right there. Because if the EU is uh, giving aid to Ukraine uh, through the World Bank, IMF, the uh, U.S. somewhat. But if demand is pulled out of Germany, uh, that could cause uh, problems uh, with the euro. Problems uh, that stretch to the U.K. and some of the weaker uh, players with there. Now, also, uh, what Credit Suisse, Barclays, uh, HSBC pulled out dozens of markets because of risks of falling afoul of financial regulators pulled out there. And also, the Russian uh, State Bank has been pulling their funds out, and they would be very wise to do that, from various uh, banks abroad. So this is uh, it's sort of like a cat-and-mouse uh, game but the the whole idea of economic sanctions uh, against uh, governments has really never worked. Because what happens is the initial stage, if you look at Iran, for instance, uh, Iran has had sanctions on it since the 70s. Yes, they've been through economic peril. But what has happened is many of the things that they bought from other countries, they now make there. So it's more of a self-contained economy, plus the... Uh, export many, many things to Iraq. So that has changed in itself. One other item we'll, we'll get here. Uh, well, let's do factory data. Then we'll talk about Fannie, Fannie and Freddie. Basically, on Fannie and Freddie, the new uh, Senate mock-up, at least what a, the bill, I should say Senate bill, where it is now write-up, not mock-up, uh, would, uh, would hurt uh, minority of borrowers because what it would do would be eliminate Fannie and Medi Freddie they are the federal uh, supported housing services. What they do is they buy mortgages from the private uh, sector and then repackage and sell them back. But that would be replaced with an industry-backed operation. But the difference would be uh, the uh, seller of the house uh, uh, would a mortgage would be responsible for the first 10%. Oh, to, to the jobs. Uh, the number of Americans uh, filing for jobless benefits hovered uh, near the three-month low last week, and factory activity in the mid-Atlantic rebound. While other data showed uh, some uh, wholesales uh, at a year and a half uh, low in February, the uh, tight stock of, of housing uh, product uh, has been constrained. Uh, sales, no doubt about that, in some uh, areas. Much of the weakness that uh, we've seen is weather related and we're going to see uh, now at uh, how the impact uh, dis dissipates, excuse me, as a much brighter outlook for the uh, U.S. economy. That is from uh, the TD Securities there uh, in New York. Initial claims of state unemployment aid increased 5,000. That's nothing. The seasonally adjusted 320,000. It's been around that level uh, for a very, very uh, long uh, time uh, now. 
A separate report this is from the Philadelphia Fed said its business activity in, uh, index rebounded uh, to uh, nine in March from a minus uh, six point three in February. You see, it was rough in uh, in the Philadelphia area, and that includes South Jersey and Delaware, uh, and of course Pennsylvania. The underlying trend in manufacturing activity has not changed significantly, despite volatility volatility at the start. We continue to expect a pickup in manufacturing activity in 14. That is from Barclays Economy uh, Economist House at Cooper House. National Association of Realtors, we usually get that report, said uh, existing home, home sales slipped four tenths of a percent to an annual rate of 4.60 million units, was the lowest since uh, January of 2012. Now, they are very interest rate sensitive, so people will have to look at that. Sales are uh, being impacted by low in- inventories, rising prices, and interest rates. That is from Bill Banfield. He's vice president of Quickham Loans in Detroit. With improved weather conditions, a drop in interest rates uh, in uh, January, I expect to see more buyers and sellers in the coming months. The 30 year fix, incidentally, uh, has dropped from a peak of uh, 4.59% uh, in uh, February, uh, excuse me, in September to 4.3% uh, in February. The median price of a, of a home uh, rose uh, 9.1% uh, in February of a year ago. So uh, roughly that's almost uh, 10% uh, there. We'll... Uh, Okay, we'll do the numbers here. These are Friday, unless otherwise uh, noted. The FTSE, 14.73. In Frankfurt, uh, 46.82. That was with the DAC. In Paris, they were 7.37. In Brussels, 7.73. Almost identical. In Madrid, in the negative, six twenty six point eight zero. In Zurich, twenty eight point zero not seven. In Moscow, in the negative, thirteen point one six. In Johannesburg, on Thursday, one fifty eight point two seven in the negative. In Bombay, all these others are on Friday, incidentally, 13.66. In Karachi, 383.03 in the negative. In Lahore, 69.71 in the negative. In Colombo, 23.31. In uh, Tehran on Wednesday, 47.30. In Sydney on Friday, 41.30. The Nikkei on Thursday, 238.29 in negative. The Hang Seng was 255.54. In Shanghai, 54.114. And in New York, negative there because of the Fed actions. Uh, 28.28 in the negative. The Nasdaq was 42.50 in the negative. The uh, Merck, uh, the commodities market, 5.79 in the negative. In San Pablo, 102.46. And in Mexico, a very good day, 405.54. That was all on Friday. We'll take a quick look at the commodities, then we'll go to an edited version of Dr. Janet Yellen's first press conference, or news conference, uh, whatever we want to call it, I guess. Nonetheless, Brent crude on Friday was up 67 cents. The spot was up a dollar and uh, 72 cents. I almost couldn't believe my eyes there. Uh, 107.12. Uh, uh, and the uh, spot, 107 Point seven zero. West Texas crude was up sixty eight cents at ninety nine dollars and 
58 cents at T Boom Pickens jumping for him. Enjoy there. He remember fifteen dollars of a bale of oil. Dubai Go was up seven dollars and ninety cents at one thousand three hundred and thirty seven dollars and sixty cents. And uh, what else can we look at here? Well, soybeans were down, that's good. Um, twenty five dollars. Soybean oil was down twenty nine cents. Wheat futures, these are all futures, were down $10.50. We've had a problem in recent days with things going up and up on the way. Now, that's going to be another interesting situation there. Uh, Russian wheat deals, if we have them there, if they need wheat, uh, that would be impacted also. They'd have to go elsewhere. U.S. farmers could or could not uh, lose out on that one. Throw that little thing in here also. Cocoa futures down uh, $4. This does it for us. For those in business, uh, have a... Uh, Productive next week, a good weekend, and we'll talk to you uh, next week on the week that was. Good day. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to join you for the first of my post-FOMC press conferences. Like Chairman Bernanke before me, I appreciate the opportunity these press conferences afford to explain the decisions of the FOMC and respond to your questions. The Federal Open Market Committee concluded a two-day meeting earlier today. As you already know from our statement, the committee decided to make another modest reduction in the pace of its purchases of longer-term securities. The committee also updated its guidance regarding the likely future path of the short-term interest rates. As I'll explain more fully in a moment, this change in our guidance does not indicate any change in the committee's policy intentions as set forth in its recent statements. Rather, the change is meant to clarify how the committee anticipates policy evolving after the unemployment rate declines below 6.5%. Let me explain the economic outlook that underlies these actions. Despite some softer recent data, the FOMC's outlook for continued progress toward our goals of maximum employment and inflation returning to 2% remains broadly unchanged. Unusually harsh weather in January and February has made assessing the underlying strength of the economy especially challenging. Broadly speaking, however, the spending and production data, while somewhat weaker than we had expected in January, are roughly in line with our expectations as of December the last time committee participants submitted economic projections. In contrast, labor market conditions have continued to improve. The unemployment rate at 6.7% is three-tenths lower than the data available at the time of the December meeting. Further, broader measures of unemployment, such as the U6 measure, which includes marginally attached workers and those working part-time but preferring full-time work, have fallen even more than the headline unemployment rate over this period. And labor force participation is ticked up. While the committee continues to monitor developments in global financial markets carefully, financial conditions remain broadly consistent with the FOMC's objectives. In sum, the FOMC continues to see sufficient underlying strength in the economy to support ongoing improvement in the labor market. Inflation has continued to run below the committee's 2% objective. Given that longer-term inflation expectations appear to be well anchored, and in light of the ongoing recovery in the United States, and in many economies around the world, the FOMC continues to expect inflation to move gradually back toward its objective. The committee is mindful that inflation running persistently below its objective could pose risks to economic performance. 
The committee also recognizes, however, that policy actions tend to exert pressure on inflation that is manifest only gradually over time. The FOMC will continue assessing incoming data carefully to ensure that policy is consistent with attaining the FOMC's longer run objectives of maximum employment and inflation of 2%. This outlook is reflected in the individual economic projections submitted in conjunction with this meeting by the 16 FOMC participants, four board members, and 12 Reserve Bank presidents. As always, each participant's projections are conditioned on his or, own, his or her own view of appropriate monetary policy. The central tendency of the unemployment rate projections has shifted down by about two-tenths since December and now stands at between 6.1 and 6.3 percent at the end of this year. The unemployment rate is projected to reach its longer run normal level by the end of 2016. The central tendency of the projections for real GDP growth stands at 2.8 to 3 percent for 2014 and remains somewhat above that of the estimates of longer run normal growth through 2016. Meanwhile, as I noted, FOMC participants continue to see inflation moving only gradually back toward 2% over time as the economy expands. The central tendency of the inflation projections is 1.5 to 1.6% in 2014, rising to 1.7 to 2.0% in 2016. Let me now return to our decision to make another measured reduction in the pace of asset purchases. Starting next month, we will be purchasing $55 billion of securities per month, down $10 billion per month from our current rate. Even after today's action takes effect, we will continue to significantly expand our holdings of longer-term securities, and we will also continue to roll over maturing Treasury securities and reinvest principal payments from the FOMC's holdings of agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities in agency mortgage-backed securities. These sizable and still increasing holdings will continue to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates, support mortgage markets, and make financial conditions more accommodative, helping to support job creation and a return of inflation to the committee's objective. The FOMC views today's decision to reduce the pace of asset purchases as consistent with the decision-making framework laid out last December and still in place today. As before, if incoming information broadly supports the committee's expectation of ongoing improvement in labor markets and inflation moving back over time toward its longer run objective, the committee will likely continue to reduce the pace of asset purchases in measured steps at future meetings. However, purchases are not on a preset course and the committee's decisions about the pace of purchases the guidance of short-term interest, short interest rates. As emphasized in the As statement, in the, statement the, new the new guidance does not guidance indicate does not any change, change in the policy in intentions of the, of the FOMC, but instead reflects but changes in the conditions we face. Let me explain this more fully. In December 2012, the committee first stated its guidance in terms of economic thresholds, stipulating that the current low range for the federal funds rate target would be appropriate at least as long as the unemployment rate remains above 6.5%. Inflation is projected to be no more than a half percentage point above our, lo above our longer run goal, and longer term inflation expectations remain well anchored. Since that time, progress in the labor market has been more rapid than we had anticipated. 
while inflation has been lower than the committee had expected. Although the thresholds served well as a useful guide to policy over the past year, last December the FOMC judged it appropriate to update that guidance, noting that the current target range for the federal funds rate would likely be maintained well past the time the unemployment rate declines below 6.5%, especially if projected inflation continues to run below the committee's 2% longer run goal. Today, the committee has further revised its forward guidance to better reflect conditions as they now stand and are likely to evolve over coming quarters. The revised formulation starts with a general description of the factors that drive FOMC decision making and then provides the FOMC's current assessment of what those factors will likely imp imply for the future path of short-term interest rates. In particular, the committee states that in determining how long to maintain the current zero to one quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate, it will assess progress, both realized and expected, toward its objectives of maximum employment and two percent inflation. In short, the larger the shortfall of employment or inflation from the respective objectives set by the FOMC, and the longer any such shortfall is expected to persist, the longer the target federal funds rate is likely to remain in the present zero to one quarter percent range. The FOMC will base its ongoing assessment on a wide range of information, including measures of labor market conditions, indicators of inflation pressures and inflation expectations, and readings on financial developments. As I've noted, the FOMC's assessment of these factors at present is consistent with the characterization provided in previous forward guidance. The committee continues to anticipate that conditions will likely warrant maintaining the current range for the federal funds rate for a considerable time after the asset purchase program ends, especially if projected inflation continues to run below the committee's 2% longer run goal and provided that longer term inflation expectations remain well anchored. The FOMC also supplemented its guidance pertaining to the period after the asset purchase program ends and the initial increase in the federal funds rate target has occurred. The statement continues to note that in deciding on the pace for removing accommodation, the committee will take a balanced approach to attaining its objectives. The statement now adds the committee's current anticipation that even after employment and inflation are near mandate consistent levels, Economic conditions may, for some time, warrant keeping short-term interest rates below levels the committee views as normal in the longer run. This guidance is consistent with the paths for appropriate policy as reported in the participants' projections, which show the federal funds rate for most participants remaining well below longer run normal values at the end of 2016. Although FOMC participants provide a number of explanations for the federal funds rate target remaining below its longer run normal level, many cite the residual impacts of the financial crisis and some note that the potential growth rate of the economy may be lower at least for a time. In summary, the committee's actions today reflect its assessment that progress in the labor market is continuing, but that much remains to be done on both the jobs and inflation fronts. Unemployment is still elevated. Underemployment and long-term unemployment remain significant concerns, and inflation is running significantly below the 